There are lots of other battles up north, but the big, the watershed battle, the battle of midway, so to speak, of the, of the uh, uh, conquest is the battle of Beth Horon. The kings by now have confederated themselves under a guy who calls himself Adonai Zedek, the Lord of Righteousness, really. He's the king of Jerusalem. He gets defeated in this battle by stones of fire from heaven. In fact, the day isn't long enough for them to complete the route. So, God, so, so Joshua asked the God to have the sun stand still, make the day longer so we can finish the job. The sun's commanded to stand still in order to give them time. And the scripture says the sun and the moon extended an entire the, the, a length of a, a, a day, an entire period of time. The kings, by the way, subsequently run and hide in a cave and are dealt with later. And this will complete the southern strategy, and the rest of the campaign is Mapa. But let's get back to this sun standing still. A lot of people are upset by that. In fact, the more you know about science and, and our solar system, the more troublesome that is. You, can't, you tend to visualize the, the earth stopping, the inertia. You, 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 just can't, it just, you can't visualize it. Let's, back, let's realize, first of all, by the way, that this, the earth does not have to stop spinning to have the day longer. A change in precession would accomplish th th that, apparently. But one thing, as you start studying this, you discover some interesting things. All ancient calendars, I can give you 14 of them, were originally based on 360-day years. All ancient calendars change after 701 B.C. for some unexplained reason. Another thing you'll notice if you do your homework is the planet Mars was terrified, just terrified the ancient cultures. The ancient cultures worshipped Mars. He was called the god of war. That still occurs in our language. We speak of martial arts. The word is still there. It's saying the same thing. There is a hypothesis by some experts, some scientific experts, that there was a near pass-by in the orbit of Mars and the Earth. And let me get into that a little bit. The belief now by some is that Earth and Mars were originally on resonant orbits. Now resonance is a concept you people in music know about. If you have a tuning fork on one side of the room and you hit it, a, a tuning fork of the same frequency and the other side of the room will pick up on that. They'll get in resonance. That's the way your radio tunes in certain stations. It makes your circuits resonant to the frequency of that particular station. So that's what they're... Con well they've discovered, as they've learned about orbital mechanics, uh, in, in our modern age, they've discovered orbits also influence each, influence each others and they can be in orbital relationships, uh, in uh, resonant relationships. And the belief is that Earth had a 360 day year and Mars a 720, they were on, on, on uh, resonant orbits. However, they had a, the orbits were such they had near passbys uh, of each other every 108 years. And they would give it, one would give energy to the other, depending which one's coming in or which one's going out. And it turns out, by modeling this, it accounts for catastrophic events on a number of occasions through history, at least seven of them. That's what put them on the trail of this thing. And uh, these energy transfers apparently stabilized, finally, in 701 B.C. And a change in precession is all necessary. Let's take a look at this. Earth is on an orbit around the sun, an elliptical orbit. And Mars is also on elliptical orbit around the sun. And uh, the re uh, the, it's a resonant orbit. Earth's on 360 days, Mars 720. In the spring, typically on March 20 or 21st, every 108 years, there'll be a near pass-by. In the spring one, it hap happens after perihelion, after the closest part of the sun. And uh, uh, the one that's ahead loses a little energy. The Earth gains a little, Mars loses a little. The second pass by, again 108 years between these things, is in the fall, October 25th. Uh, excuse me, August, uh, yeah, October 25th. This time Mars is coming from the outside of aphelion, that is the furthest from the Sun. It passes behind the Earth, causing the Earth to lose some energy, Mars to pick up some energy, sort of a slingshot effect, sort of. And so uh, what this causes then, this, th these transfers occur Every time, every 108 years, some amount, some add, some less. And this has all been modeled, by the way, to some extent, a, a de a, quite a detailed extent. When they finally stabilize, the Earth is no longer 360 days, it's 365 and a quarter days. Mars is no longer 720, it's now 687. But that means the calendars on the Earth need adjustment. The Romans, of course, add four and a quarter, uh, uh, five and a quarter days. 
Uh, other calendars do it slightly differently. The, the Hebrew ones do. I really, they add, uh, they add a month, seven times every 19 years. A very weird thing. And all the rabbis have books. They expect, why did Hezekiah do it that way? And uh, they don't explain why did he have to do anything at all? Why did it have to change? They don't talk about that. Well, this, this has been very detailed. makes some very interesting reading. But um, and, and it sounds like just a conjecture, except thanks to Jonathan Swift, it seems to be substantiated. And uh, let's back up a little and talk about early telescope technology. 1610 is when Galileo invented the telescope and discovered the four moons of Jupiter and the Saturn's rings, pretty obvious. In about 1781, Herschel has a better telescope by then. He discovers Uranus. 1787, he, with a, he finds two moons of Uranus. 1789, two more moons of Uranus. And 1846, Levier uh, discovers Neptune and one of its moons. It's in 1877 when Asaph Hall, with a brand new telescope at the U.S. Naval Observatory, discovers the two moons of Mars and makes astronomical history. They didn't know it had two moons. The reason they didn't, Deimos has, uh, it's, uh, one's, uh, they're very, very small. One is only eight miles in diameter and it's almost black. It has a reflectivity or albedo of only three percent. And uh, what's strange about this is that uh, the, the small one is going backwards. It's the only one that goes backwards in the entire solar system. And uh, you say, okay, so what? So you got these, they, uh, by the way, they, they mean, it means fear and panic in Greek, by the way. Appropriate for the God, you know, the God of War. But anyway, most of you know Gulliver's Travels, writing by Jonathan Swift. He, he lived between 1667 and 1745. And in 1726, he wrote Gulliver's Travels. Um, and most of us know the val there, there are several voyages of Gulliver in his books. We all know the Lilliputes, the little people. That's the one that makes the cute little movies and stuff. By the way, these things were intended as political satire, not children's stories. Through the years, they've become popular children's stories. But it, in his third voyage of, of Gulliver, he's said to go to a place called Laputa where the astronomers there brag that they know about the two moons of Mars and the astronomers in London don't. And they go on to talk about the size, the revolution, and the orbits of the two moons of Mars. Within a 20% accuracy, by the way. You say, well, so what? Well, the problem is this. Jonathan Swift published Gulliver's Travels in 1726, 151 years before they were discovered by astronomers. Now, how do you explain that? Well, one conjecture is, well, he was just lucky. I don't think so. They're within tw the, the, the numbers are in, in his little story, and, and, uh, very, and surprisingly, at, within 20%. And one of, the fact that one's going backwards is, is, is astonishing. Well, how would, he, how would he have guessed that? So the other possibility is that did he, did, he, did he guess it? I don't think so. Did he really know that? I don't think so. He knew Herschel. These people knew each other. And the astronomy world didn't know there were two moons of Mars. And I don't think Jonathan Swift did either. I suspect he drew on some legends to color and embroider his political satire. That's really, it's, that's all going. What he didn't realize is that the things he was drawing upon were eyewitness accounts. And in order to see the two moons of Mars, Mars would have to be close enough to the Earth to see with the naked eye the two moons of Mars. And so this is a strange corroboration of the theory, of the long day. Let's go back to Joshua. There's a third of a million men at Beth Horon. On October 25th of 1404 B.C., Mars is on a polar pass at only 70,000 miles from the Earth. It appears to rise 50 times the size of the moon. There are severe earthquakes and land tides. By the way, do you know that we know there's lotion tides. Did you know there are land tides? They're only about an inch, so you don't notice them, but they're there. They can be measured. Anyway, here we have severe earthquakes and land tides. And... Uh, there's a polar shift of about five degrees, which would lengthen the day. And meteors follow about two to three hours later at about 30,000 miles an hour. And the meteors are amazing because they hit only Israel's enemies. I want you to think about that. God put them in orbit whenever, but in such a way as to anticipate the enemies of Israel to act, they act as you know, like fire from heaven and wipe out Israel's enemies. Bizarre. What's interesting is that this legend of the long day isn't just in the Bible. We're indebted to Emanuel Velikovsky who discovered the legends in China of the long night about the same time. The long night of China. So it's, uh, these things are... But the campaign, of course, in the south we have the various treaty... They had a treaty with the Gibeonites, the Battle of the Beth Horn and all that. And then there's some quick surprise attacks they get into in the south. 
Uh, in the north, we have uh, Hazard's Alliance, a slower guerrilla war going up up there. But in any case, they, uh, before, uh, before the thing's over, they uh, conquer the land. The book of Joshua has also been contrasted with the book of Ephesians, a victorious cr uh, Christian living. In Joshua, we have Israel. In Ephesians, we have the church. In Joshua, they're entering and possessing. In Ephesians, we are to enter and possess our possession. In uh, Joshua, there's an earthly inheritance. In Ephesians, speaks of our heavenly inheritance. Joshua, it's given in Abraham. Of course, in Ephesians, it's given in Christ. Each is opened by a divinely appointed leader. Each is given grace and received by faith. Each uh, has a sphere of uh, striking divine revelations in both books. So there's, it, uh, uh, Alan Redpath has made a, his, a, a book called Victorious Christian Living. He contrasts the two books as, as parallels. Each is a scene of warfare and conflict. Ephesians, of course, has Ephesians 6, our armor of God. It, we are also in a warfare, a spiritual warfare. So that's interesting. But there's another comparison. I want to tell you, frankly, up front, I can't find anyone that agrees with me. And I don't mean they disagree with me, but I can't find any commentary that has, highlights the fact that Joshua is a model of the book of Revelation. First of all, Joshua is Yehoshua. It's the name of Jesus on, on, on the book. Yehoshua is a variant, in effect, of Yeshua. In each book, you've got a military commander dispossessing the land of its usurpers. In Joshua, it's the land of Canaan. In Revelation, it's the planet Earth. In each case, it's a seven-year campaign. And it's against seven of an original ten nations in each case. What's strange is you study Jericho, the Torah is ignored in Jericho. They're not supposed to do anything on the Sabbath. That's ignored in Jericho. In the Torah, it says the Levites are not to go to war. They lead the procession in Jericho. And I could go on and on. And it's interesting, Joshua first sends in two witnesses. What did they accomplish? Not battle plan intelligence. They got Rahab saved, who, becomes on the, who gets on the family tree of, of David, by the way. And there's seven trumpet events. They keep silent until the seventh deal here. It's interesting, when you get to Revelation chapter 8, before the trumpet judgments, there's silence in heaven for half an hour. You've got the same echoing, the same structure here. It, gets, it goes more than that. In Joshua, the enemies are confederated under a leader in Jerusalem, Adonai Zedek, the Lord of Righteousness. Of course, in Revelation, you have the Antichrist. And uh, they're ultimately defeated with hailstones of fire in heaven in both cases, with signs in the sun and the moon and so forth. And in both cases, the, kid, the kings hide in caves. In fact, in Revelation 6, rocks fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. The parallel, once you see a little of it, when you study Joshua and study Revelation, you'll be startled with how apparently, deliberately, structurally parallel the two books are. Well, after the conquest of the land, of course, they divide the land. The tribes are allocated their portions by casting lots. We've got Manasseh up there in the north and Gad and the half-tribe of, uh, half of Manasseh and Gad and Reuben on the, uh, that are uh, east of the Jordan. And uh, then we have uh, all the rest of them being uh, Ephraim, of course. It becomes uh, idiomatic of the whole northern group. Dan is given a, a, a place that's west of Benjamin, but he can't hold it. And when Samson finally dies, who doesn't accomplish much, but a bunch of pranks, they can't hang on to it. So they go up north to a place called Laish, and so Dan really settles in the north part of the country, but don't, they don't really help much. Um, during the judges, Deborah upset because Dan doesn't even leave his ships. What's he doing in ships in the first place? And so Dan spins off from the Commonwealth of Israel. It's one of the reasons why he's not mentioned in Revelation when the 12 tribes are listed, strangely enough. There's a whole thing about that we'll deal with when we get there. Then we got Benjamin and Judah in the south and Simeon to the south. So we have the various tribes. Now the Levites don't get an inheritance of land. They get 48 cities instead because the Lord's of their inheritance. Six of those cities are designated as cities of refuge. And uh, three, on the east, three east of the Jordan, three west of the Jordan. And we want to talk a little bit about cities of refuge. I said everything, well, every, all these strange things, they sound strange to our ears until we understand how they point to Jesus Christ. The idea of a city of refuge, see, they didn't have prisons. They didn't have a police force. If you killed somebody, the next of kin came after you. That was the, that was the way it worked. Well, suppose it was an accidental death, what we would call manslaughter. Well, if you accidentally killed someone, what you did immediately is you hightailed it to one of the cities of refuge. And if you could, if that, I'm assuming now this is not premeditated murder, if it's a, what we call manslaughter. And what you did is, uh, you, if you could get to the city of refuge, you were secured there uh, in safety from the avenger of blood. The next of kin would be after you, but if, you're in, if you can uh, take refuge in the city of refuge, if you can visit the city fathers, this, this was a, a manslaughter thing, as long as you're in the city, you're safe. If you left the city, you're fair game. 
That's why it's called a city refuge. And this situation stayed as it was until the high priest down in Jerusalem died. Now you look most commentaries as this guy, you know, just a quaint tribal custom here. But wait a minute, what's this guy, what's the high priest got to do with the situation, one way or the other? You follow me? It's a, a strange situation. Well, let's take a, let's analyze this a little bit, um, see if it applies to us. Let's talk about the crucifixion of Christ. Was it premeditated murder or was it manslaughter? From God's point of view, it was premeditated. He was foreordained before the foundation. It was God's, it was by His determinate counsel and so forth. From our point of view, what did Jesus say? Father, forgive them for what? No, not what we do. So we can use that and say, okay, this is at least, man from our point of view, it's, man it's manslaughter, not premeditated. Okay, so uh, the next question is, is where is our city of refuge? It's in Jesus Christ, of course. For how long is this day? Until the high priest died. Who is our high priest? When did he die? Right then. So you can, you can, you, I'll let you, if you see that, great. Uh, uh, that's, um, there's another little quaint thing that deserves comment, and that's the daughters of Zelophehad. When Moses was establishing the laws of inheritance, a guy by the name of Zelophehad came to Moses and said, I got a problem. I only have, f I have five daughters, no sons. How are they going to inherit? Moses does the right thing. He goes to the Lord. The Lord tells, says, Make an exception. So there's an exception written in the Torah for the daughters of Zelophehad. And uh, on the rules, of, if, a, if a man has no sons and the daughters marry within the tribe, the, the uh, uh, inheritance will flow through to her husband. You follow me? That's what it basically says. It was requested by Moses in Numbers 27. And when you get to the land, and Joshua's laying out the land here, these five daughters come and say, by the way, check the records, read the fine print. We got an exception. Joshua does. He, sure enough, you do. And that's in, John, uh, that's in Joshua 17. What most people who read this don't understand is how this worked. What happened was, if the do he had no sons, when the daughters married, the father of the bride adopted the husband as his son by adoption. And you'll find that in Ezra 2 and Nehemiah 7 and a number of other places. It's amazing how you can go through most commentators, and I can't find any that really understand. They say this is just a quaint tribal custom. They don't, they don't attach any significance to this uh, theologically. Every detail in the Bible is there by deliberate design. That's my challenge to you. Check it out. It turns out the claims of Christ hang on this. This anticipates the lineage of Christ because there's a blood curse on the line of Joseph, but Jesus is not a son of Joseph. He's, a, he's just a legal father of Jesus. He's, that's why you have a virgin birth. He's born of Mary. Mary's father was Heli. She was the only, she, she had no brothers. When Mary marries Joseph, Heli adopts Joseph as his son. And that's how the line of, that's, when you go to Matthew, Matthew has the Jewish line from Abraham down through Joseph to Christ. Luke, being a doctor and interested in his humanity, starts at Adam, goes all the way from, from Adam to Abraham. From Abraham to David, they're identical. But at David, Luke takes a left turn and goes through a sec the second surviving son of Bathsheba, not the first one, which was Solomon, and down through Mary. And uh, so the point is, uh, Jesus is of the house and lineage of David, but those are two different lines. So we'll get into that when we get to the book of Luke. But all this hangs on the daughters of Zelophehad, this quaint little strange thing in the Torah. All these little rules you find, one way or another, will point to Jesus Christ.